Well, since you already broke the mood, I'm not going to tell the joke about the deacon and the de dead donkey. We'll save that for another time. <laughs> good morning. It is so good to see each of you here today. I, I'm just amazed at all the new beginnings that uh, we've witnessed this morning. We, the young graduates as they're getting ready to start their life post high school and the excitement and the... Uh, the ideas and the wonderful things that they're going to encounter in their life. And young Zachary uh, starting his new life in Christ, uh, being baptized into Christ. And it's just wonderful. And we've got another new beginning today. And we're going to talk about uh, the position of a deacon here in just a moment. But when God has special work to do, he calls faithful people to do that work. In fact, in the book of Acts, provides for us a precedent for what we're about to do today. Of the Jerusalem church, we read in Acts chapter 6 about what we've come to believe are the first deacons. Now, they're not called deacons in the book of Acts, but certainly the jobs that they do, and then later on in First and Second Timothy, as Paul defines the role of a deacon, we can see early on, in the church in its infancy, that there were some needs that arose and certain men were called to fill that gap. And so we read in Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now let me stop right there and just share with you that anytime you get people together as loving and as kind and as full of the Holy Spirit as they might be, every once in a while you get a little ruffled feather here and there. I'm sure that's never happened at Draper. Nobody's ever had a single ruffled feather. Uh, but sometimes that does happen, and we saw in the early church that that did occur. Now, these Hellenistic Jews, just to give you a definition of who they were, they were true Jews, but what they had done is they had adopted the Greek culture in their lives. Now, they were what we would call liberal Jews, right? And so the, the Hebrew Jews, now, they were very conservative. They did everything exactly exactly according to scripture they didn't step outside of the bounds of their culture oh no and so when they looked at the hellenistic jews those greek jews oh my they kind of looked down on them and then there was a a practice of the early church to distribute food for widows and orphans and that was a great great ministry in the early church it's a great ministry today as we reach out to people who are in need people who uh, don't have food or the ability to take care of themselves. We reach out, we do what we can. That's a beautiful ministry, don't you agree? Well, in that distribution of the food, the Hellenistic Jews, those Grecian Jews, they felt like they were being kind of slighted. You know, I can just imagine maybe the, the Hebrew Jews, they, they got a great big basket of food, you know, and maybe the Hellenistic Jews, they just got a little, little flat loaf of bread or something like that. Who knows what was really going on and whether it was true or whether it was just a perceived uh, misjustice, uh, we don't really know, but that's what was going on. And so it kind of stirred up the church a little bit, and there were some problems. Uh, you can just imagine the chatter going around in the church about all of that. And so the twelve uh, got together, and here's what, the, here's what the next verse says. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Now, what they're saying is, look, everybody in the church has a job to do. Did you realize that if you are a born-again believer, if you've been immersed into Christ and you've been raised up a new creature in Christ Jesus, you've been given a job. Now, maybe you're doing your job, maybe you're not. Only you can answer that question. But every single person who is immersed into Christ is given a gift, and they're given responsibility. They're given a job. And if you don't do your job, somebody else has to pick up the slack. Because this work is just too important not to be done. Would you agree with that? The, church, the work of the church is of such importance 
that it has to be done. And so those of us who have embraced this, this work of the Lord, we realize how important it is, and we know certain things need to get done. But if somebody has to do your job, then it just puts more on them, and they can't do their job. And so the job of the apostles was to study the word of God and to share the gospel, not only with the congregation, but also to teach others how to carry that message out into the world. And that work was getting disrupted. And so they came up with a plan. As they prayed about it, as God revealed to them what needed to be done, here's what they said. Therefore, the brethren... Select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom may be put in charge of this task. So here's what happened. The, the twelve said to the congregation, look around in the congregation and see who is already serving. Who's already showing those characteristics of wisdom, someone who is full of the Spirit, following Christ, reading and studying His Word. Do you see among yourselves somebody that fits that characteristic? And I want you to go to them, and I want you to talk to them and say, listen, we've got some physical needs that need to be taken care of in the church. Would you be willing to do that? And that's how they approached these seven. They saw that they were full of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. They saw that they had wisdom, that they were caring and kind and compassionate. And later on, we find that in First and Second Timothy, those qualifications are more and more defined. And so they did that. And then it goes on. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of of the word. So the statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. So when you're looking for a deacon, you want, want, some, you want somebody that's full of the Spirit, somebody who is faithful to the church. And they found Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. They also found Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmeus, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, and these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And so we see what we're about to do today, we see an example in the very early stages of the church. And you know what? God hadn't changed the plan, has he? God hasn't changed his word. We're going to continue at Draper Christian Church to do things in a biblical way. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. We like to do th Bible things in Bible ways at Draper Christian Church. Uh, we weren't inspired like the apostles were uh, to write down Scripture, but what we are is full of the Spirit to be able to look at Scripture, discern what is right, and then follow that pattern. That's what we're trying to do here today, is follow the pattern that God has set in his word. And here was the result. The word of God kept on spreading and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. So when we do things God's way, great things happen. And what happened was that the gospel of Jesus Christ began to spread even more and more as the early church followed the leading of the inspired words of the apostles as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, nothing's changed. That's still true today. Later, as the church spread across the Mediterranean world, Paul and Barnabas journeyed through Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. The Apostle Paul knew that these new converts needed someone to shepherd them and guard them from falling away. See, the Apostle Paul, as he established churches, he would come, he would share the gospel of Jesus Christ, he would tell them many, many truths about the Word of God, but then he would leave, and in his absence, he wanted to have men appointed 
to be there to continue to shepherd the flock, to feed the word of God to them, to help them and nurture them to grow in the faith. The Apostle Paul knew that these new converts needed someone to shepherd them. So Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas, this is in Acts 14, appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, and they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so Paul charged the elders of the church at Ephesus, here's what he said to them, be on guard for yourselves and for the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. What a huge task the scriptures puts on the elders of the church. You know, preachers come and go. I hope I stay for a long time. I love you guys, and I want to hang out. I really, really do. But what if God calls me somewhere else? God's put in place elders in your church. They're your spiritual shepherds. They're the ones that pray for you. They're the ones that see that things in the church go well when it comes to uh, the Word of God and sharing the Word of God in Sunday school venues. Uh, in different instances, is, as we meet around the Lord's table is a beautiful example. You know, that's the shepherd's job to make sure that the word of God is getting to you precisely the way the scriptures say it. What a huge task that is. So what we can see in that is a dissemination of duties. We can see that the deacons have a certain kind of job and we can see that the elders have a certain kind of job. Deacons minister in the areas of compassion and benevolence. That's their job, to meet the physical needs many times of the church. And we've seen the role of deacon develop over the history of the church to where as the needs arise in a, in a church like this, we have a deacon, for example, who's in charge of the physical structure of the building. We have deacons that are in charge of particular ministries like youth ministries and deacons who oversee our food pantry ministry. And all of those things are important. And what that does, it enables the elders and the preacher to be able to do their job. And what a beautiful way God has set up his church to function in that way. As each performs his ministry, the church will become more and more Christ-like. Others will be drawn into the fellowship and the influence of the gospel will multiply. So when we do things God's way, the church will naturally grow. When the needs of the people are being met, whether they're felt needs, that's what the area of the deacons deal with, felt needs, or real needs, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, as those needs are being met, the church runs harmoniously and the gospel of Jesus Christ is magnified in the congregation and people come to know the Lord. So today, we come together to ordain a deacon. His name is Jim Craig, and Jim, I'd like you to come forward at this time. And the elders as well. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the congregation a question. And then as Jim stands here before you, I'm going to ask Jim some questions. And, and guess what? You guys don't have to stumble for the answer. I'm going to give you the answers. Isn't that great? I love those tests, don't you? Where you get the question and the answer. You're going to get both. To the congregation. Have you as a church considered seriously the decision to accept Jim Craig to serve as a deacon of Draper Christian Church? If so, answer, we have. We have. Jim, do you desire to be set apart as a deacon of the church? If so, answer, I do. Will you be faithful to God's word? If so, answer, I will. Will you encourage the members to follow the leadership of the elders in this church? If so, answer, I will. Amen. 
I want you to turn now and be seated, and the elders are going to pray over you. Father, as we bless you, know if you have got a few that will bless us our opportunity to take a closer look at our final grace. Thank you for Brother Jim's willingness to serve and to use his time and his energy to promote your kingdom here on earth. And we praise you for Brother Jim and uh, all the other deacons that we have in our midst here that we can uh, depend upon them to look after the material part of the kingdom here, this part of your kingdom here on earth. We praise you and ask that you would continue to bless Brother Jim and his family that he might uh, enjoy many more years of service uh, within your kingdom. And we ask all these things in the precious name of your Son, our Savior Christ. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who makes all of this possible. We're thankful for the willingness that Jim has to serve as a deacon, to be a leader among the people who have fled the church. We just pray, God, that you would give him the wisdom, the guidance, the strength that he needs to convey your heaven. And be with all of the deacons that you have before us. Help them to work in a loving, harmonious way. And uh, let it all be for your glory. Help the church to grow. As uh, Brother Mike has said, that we all work together. Christ will. God will bring forth the increase. Thank you for, again for Jim and what he means to us. Uh, guide him and direct him in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome our new deacon. Thank you, elders, and thank you, Jim. We appreciate that. You know, again, as I, as I think about the number of new things that are happening in the church, uh, it's, it's kind of an exciting time in the church. We're going to miss Brandon, certainly, and Stephen as they go off, and but I, we hope and pray that, that you guys, uh, this will always be your church, a special place for you. We love you, and uh, we're going to encourage you. We're going to continue to pray for you wherever uh, the Lord takes you. We're excited about your new beginning. Exactly, we're excited about your new beginning. And Jim, as you uh, start your service for the Lord. But really and truly, this, this service is, is for all of us. And for some of us, it'll just be a reminder of what God's already called us to do. But every one of us really do have a charge to keep. God has called every one of us to a special place in service to the Lord's church. I want you to think about that word service for just a minute. The English word deacon is found only three times in the King James the New King James, and the New American Standard Bible. But the root word of that word deacon, diakonos, is found 30 times in the New Testament. 20 of those times that that word is found in the New Testament, it's translated as servant. The other times, it's translated as minister. And only three times it's translated as the word deacon. And, and the word deacon is really a transliteration. Aren't you impressed that I know that word? Well, here's what it means. A transliteration is when we take a Greek-sounding word and just kind of change the, the letters in it a little bit so it sounds kind of like English. For example, baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, and so... It means to immerse, to dip, or to plunge. But what we do is we, we change the letters around a little bit and we make the word baptism. Now, you guys were wondering how a good old Church of Christ preacher, Christian church preacher, was going to work baptism into this message, didn't you? Well, I just did. So check that off. But what we did with the word diakonos is we just changed the letters around a little bit 
and we just come up with the word deacon. And the reason we did that is because in those three instances in the New Testament where that word deacon is found, it is speaking specifically of someone who has been set apart for a particular ministry in the church as a leader. For example, what we've done today with Jim. But every one of us, every one of us is a deacon. Every one of us is a minister. Every one of us has called to be a servant in the Lord's church. According to Scripture, a servant is one who is under authority of others. That's from the Lord himself. And every one of us have placed ourselves willingly under the authority of of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Christ clearly taught us that the one who humbly serves God is the one who is greatest in the kingdom. Isn't that interesting? We think of servants as lowly, you know, unimportant. But you know what? In the Lord's economy, a servant is of great value and is of the utmost importance. And so the more we serve, the more God's A light of joy shines upon us. All of us are under the authority of the head of Christ, Jesus, and he speaks to us through the authority of his word. That's what I wanted to talk about just a few minutes today as we wrap up this service. I want to talk about the authority of God's word in our life. The charge and responsibility given to us and to our newly installed deacon is shared among every member. Leaders are but examples to follow. So as we look at the elders and as we look at the deacons and we observe their faithfulness and their service to the Lord, all that means is, you know what? We need to do likewise. We need to follow their example. We need to follow, first of all, of course, the example of Christ. And as we see them following Christ, we too follow likewise. Now, where do they get All of the authority that they have, well, they get it from the Word of God. And the Word of God makes nations safe, by the way. If we were to turn our nation back to God, what a great country we'd have once again. The Word of God makes nations safe. It makes families strong. It makes hearts pure. It brings peace to the soul. And the entrance of God's light and God's word into a dark and dying world puts away confusion and brings about peace. It gives triumph over folly. The Bible, God's word and eternal word, is where we discover how to live for Christ. If you want to know how you're supposed to live, certainly watch the elders, watch the deacons, watch the other mature Christians in the church. But the best place to look is always right in the Word of God to look at the example of Christ. The Bible, God's holy and eternal Word, is where we discover how we're supposed to live for Christ. His Word is a fountain of truth that speaks of grace, of love, of holiness, of heaven, and of hell. Today we are all charged to teach God's Word plainly, simply, powerfully, and personally, to teach only the Bible, not our opinions or the opinions that are imposed upon us by a culture that is lost and dying and heading in the wrong direction. I don't know where you're getting your light. I don't know where you're getting your truth, but I'm going to look to the Word of God. I'm going to look to my elders. I'm going to look to my deacons, and I'm going to find out what I'm supposed to be doing, and I'm going to listen to them and not what culture is telling me to do, and I pray you'll do the same. Today we're called to renew our commitment to Christ and His bride, the church. We've got a job to do, and the job's never been bigger. We live in a culture and a time that needs Christ more than ever before, and He's called us, us, together, to accomplish that task, to be that light in this community in this place called Eden, North Carolina. May this charge stir us to greater heights of service as we render uncompromised commitment to the one who gave his life for us all. Let us pray. 
all-knowing and all-wise God who in the earthly church selected workers to continue Jesus' ministry on earth, bless this service of dedication. We all have a charge to keep, every one of us, Lord. You know our hearts. You know the needs of our congregation. We believe that you have guided us in our selection, and we ask now that your Spirit will empower your servants for the ministries you have assigned. Cleanse our hands and our hearts. Give us wisdom to determine what should be done. Courage to begin and strength to finish. Protect us from division and strife. Grant harmony and peace. May repetition not make us indifferent. Nor habit tempt us to offer you less than our best. Rather, may our sacrifice of time and effort be worthy of him who sacrificed his all for his church. Thank you, Father, for considering us faithful and calling us to this service. In Christ's name I pray, amen. 